Hello and welcome to today's textile talk. My name is Nancy Bavor and I'm the director of the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. And I'm super excited today to host today's event with Jennifer Swope and to close out another year of excellent textile talks. And don't worry, we will be back in 2022. Textile Talks is a weekly virtual series presented by six different fiber organizations each Wednesday, including Studio Art Quilt Associates, the International Quilt Museum, Surface Design Association, Modern Quilt Guild, the Quilt Alliance, and San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. Today's presentation and Q&A session will last about an hour so that we can continue to offer these talks for free. I hope you'll consider making a donation or by becoming a member of our museum. We'll put a link in the chat shortly or you can visit the SJMQT website. During today's presentation, please use the Q&A for questions, the chat box for greeting others, and the post-event survey for commentary and constructive feedback. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them off or on. And we respectfully ask that you be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. I want to especially thank our 21-22 Textile Talk sponsors who make this series free and accessible to audiences worldwide. Our sponsors include at the platinum level, Moda Fabrics and Supplies and Quilting Daily. At the silver level, Aurafil and eQuilter.com. And at the bronze level, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spool Seminars, Misty Fuse Attached Ink, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Thai Silks, and The Quilt Show and I hope you will patronize these sponsors. For those of you near San Jose, California, I encourage you to come check out our current exhibitions, including Studio Art Quilt Associates traveling exhibition, Layered and Stitched, 50 Years of Innovative Art. And if you don't live in California, this exhibition will also travel in 2022 to the Dairy Barn Art Center in Athens, Ohio. That's from May, 2022 to July, 2022 and in 2023 to the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, opening there in May of 2023. Many of these works are from private collections are lent by the artists and unlikely to be seen in this format ever again. So I hope you have a chance to see it somewhere. And in addition to this landmark exhibition, the museum also presents more impact climate, climate change with Tapestry Weavers West. And also we are exhibiting work by our current artists and artists in residence, Rebecca Herman and Mark Schaffner. These three exhibitions will be open to the public during our regularly scheduled hours through January 2nd. And to learn more about these exhibitions and upcoming events, please visit our website at sjquiltmuseum.org. And now I am so delighted to introduce today's speaker. Jennifer Swope is the David and Roberta Logie, Logie Associate Curator of Textiles and Fashion Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. A recipient of the Lois F. McNeil Fellowship, she attended, attended the Winter Tour Program in American Culture, receiving a master's degree in American Material Culture from the University of Delaware. Swope co-authored and curated Quilts in Color, the Pilgrim Roy Collection, a catalog and exhibition that opened at the MFA in Boston in 2014. And her most recent work has been curating the catalog and exhibition, Fabric of a Nation, American Quilt Stories, that opened at the MFA in 2021. And if you don't have a copy of this amazing catalog, um, I suggest you order it from your favorite bookseller. Um, it's one you'll wanna definitely have in your library. So we're thrilled today to welcome Jennifer virtually at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. Thank you and welcome Jennifer. Well, thank you, Nancy. I'm going to start sharing my screen and I am so happy to be here today and uh, grateful for um, what is an international forum, clearly, of uh, quilt quilters and fans of quilting everywhere. Um, and thank you so much for the um, the praise of the publication. Um, so that is one way that everyone can experience the exhibition or get a sense of it because the um, the book Fabric of a Nation American Quilt Stories 
includes 58 examples of textile art from the Museum of Fine Arts collection, uh, made and used in the Americas, and is a uh, was a was a privilege to co-author with Pam Parmel and Lauren Whitley. Um, you can see that the cover of the book, uh, which is behind me, uh, and is also Im uh, an image of it is on the slide, uh, is uh, is a work by Bisa Butler, which is part of the MFA's collection. Uh, it is titled To God and Truth and uh, is based on a photograph of the Morris Brown baseball team taken in 1899, which we'll have a chance to talk about together. So the exhibition itself, um, it includes 50 works of art. Uh, and uh, those works of art span a little over 300 years, starting in the 17th century and going all the way to today. We have the work of 16 living artists, which of course includes Bisa Butler. And we have um, nearly 20 works of art that can be attributed to artists of color or communities of color. Um, because, the, because the objects uh, span 300 years, we often don't know the names of, uh, of the artists or, or of the groups of people who made these works of art. Um, but, uh, but we thought that the visitors could um, could experience both 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 types of art, those attributed to artists and those and those not, in the same space and come away with a, an appreciation. Um, so this is just I was so excited uh, in early October when uh, these details from Bisa Butler's to God and Truth uh, went up on banners uh, in the front of uh, the facade, the main and the Huntington Avenue entrance of the Museum of Fine Arts. It was a really proud day for me and uh, the rest of the team who worked so hard to put together this exhibition. And when I say the team, I mean, I'm referring to our internal team of amazing colleagues that include people from, uh, from interpretation to exhibit design to textile conservation, um, and uh, of course our colleagues in publications and photography who made the book possible. But there's also a larger team. I like to say that it takes many hands to lift a quilt show. And from the very beginning, when we were considering the book, which actually came before the exhibition, uh, we started working on the book in late 2017. Um, and then actually this didn't become an exhibition, I an, an exhibition idea until about two years later in 2019. Um, but our community, uh, our team of, of, uh, of people who care about this, these American quilts, American quilt stories, and this project in particular, um, is vast. And um, Dr. Carolyn Metzlumi very kindly, uh, whose work is represented in the show, she talked to me a lot about, um, about quilts and what inspires her and, and why she does the work that she does. And I thought it was a good way to actually the whole team thought it would be a good way to set up the viewer for how we are interpreting these these quilts and how we are um, essentially privileging the voice of the of contemporary artists who work in this medium or inspired by this medium. Um, in the sense that uh, the frame that we are using to look at them is uh, is in many ways well articulated by Dr. Carolyn Matsulumi, and that they quilt because they are familiar. They people, many people have quilt stories of their own, which we we value and want to hear. Um, they can they can be sort of a soft landing for often difficult conversations. And in the planning of the exhibition, which you know obviously started 2019, so that was that was about three years ago, three and a half years ago. Um, it was, it was before the pandemic started. Um, we always wanted to have these three works of art be uh, uh, constitute the introduction because um, while the book is arranged chronologically from oldest to the newest works of art, we wanted to bring people, we wanted to bring the visitor into the question of why are quilts associated with America and and really so what is America in people's minds and and who are Americans? So uh, we always wanted to have these three pieces. One, on the left is Irene Williams vote quilt, which she made in 1975 in G's Bend, Alabama. Um, she used a pattern uh, printed with the words vote uh, in all caps uh, in red, white, and blue. And um, this work was made 10 years after Do Dr. Martin Luther King came and spoke at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in G's Bend, Alabama, encouraging people to 
take the ferry across the Alabama River to the Camden County Courthouse to register to vote. And the response to that was to shut down the ferry, which did not open again until the 21st century, actually just within the last decade. Um, so one thing that we were finding was that a lot of the stories that were from the past and not actually the very distant past are very relevant to what we are experiencing as a country, what people individually are experiencing um, today. And so we wanted to make sure that those stories were, were highlighted whenever possible. In the center, uh, we have one of five works of art that we borrowed from private collectors and, and, uh, and museums in the exhibition. It's very clearly not a quilt. It is a woven uh, blanket. Some people might call it a, it's a, basically a variant of a, um, a first phase chief's blanket, so called chief's blanket. And um, it is borrowed from uh, a private collector and uh, it, it tells a, again, a, a difficult story to tell in, in our country's history of the Navajo um, or the Diné being forced marched from their homelands to Fort Sumner in Northern New Mexico. The blanket itself was woven by a woman who was imprisoned at Bosque Redondo, which is uh, uh, at Fort Sumner. And she, uh, she wove this blanket for James Cooper McKee, who was the chief medical officer of New Mexico between 1868 and 1870 when, when this was made. And um, in it, she included a star and a G, and, uh, and that is a tribute to his service in Company G of the 27th Regiment in the beginning of the Civil War. So like many of these quilts and, and other works of art, it's, it's not a quilt, it's meant to be a, a bed cover, um, but we don't know the name of the maker and or the, or the maker slash artist. And, uh, and that's an important part of, of this exhibition to bring both, both kinds of works together and show them on uh, equal visual footing, if you will. And then the quilt on the right was made by uh, mostly women, farm, farm women, and, and, uh, and, then, and with to over 280 names. Uh, most of the named individuals on the quilt are, uh, were from Northwestern Indiana, and uh, several were born uh, after the death of Susan B. Anthony, whose name appears right here, and the uh, red, red stripe two over from the left. Um, and uh, again, we don't know, even though there are over 280 names, we don't really know which, which of those names can be, uh, can be assigned to, to the maker of this quilt. Um, but we are fairly certain that it was made in support of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in Indiana, which occurred on January 1920. And you can see the people when they visit, the visitors are very engaged with the works of art and reading the labels. And it's really affirming for all of us who have worked so hard to bring this to, to people. Um, and then of course, we wanted the Bisa Butler to pull people into this introductory space with uh, her work to God and Truth. We have a terrific video that, um, that features her working in her studio. Uh, actually, and if you watch it carefully, you can see that she's working on this piece. And, um, and then in the label, because we have these wonderful, <coughs> vast horizontal spaces for long labels, uh, we include a photograph um, that she found in the National Archives of the Morris Brown baseball team. And uh, if you have a chance to go online, you can listen to her speak about her choice of this photograph. Um, Morris Brown College, which still exists, it's in Atlanta. Uh, it was founded uh, about 10 years before this photograph was taken by African-Americans for African-Americans. And that's why she wanted to use it. Um, she likes to remind people that she does not use a drop of paint. <laughs> she uses many, many, many pieces of cloth that she builds up in layers like paint. And I would say that universally, um, the response to this has been one of just sort of shock and awe in a sense, because um, it is it is work that you might have seen before you enter the exhibition, but to see it up close with the choice of fabrics, all the patterns, all the colors, with what she's able to do with the layering of those pieces of cloth, and then what, what happens when she quilts it is, is, is really extraordinary. 
And in that section after that, that's when we start, we go to the chronology, essentially. So we didn't want to start with a sort of a march through time just quite yet. We wanted to bring people into these larger questions of who is American and what is America. And we felt that quilts were the perfect medium to do that with. Um, and particularly in our collection, we were very fortunate to acquire a number of quilts by Florence Pito, who some may know as the uh, person who helped Elector Havemeyer Webb assem assemble the collection at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont. And in the 1950s, um, she took, uh, she was an extraordinary woman who, um, who taught people about quilts, she gave lectures, she organized exhibitions, and um, she also collected old textiles, which at, in the mid 1950s, between 1952 and 1954, she made a, a number of quilts from these older textiles. And um, I can say this to this group because I assume, you know, that, that we all know the difference between a pieced quilt and an applique quilt, um, but her quilts are actually all applique, but because she, I think, was using them in perhaps as instruction or perhaps they were just for her own pleasure. Um, but I think she wanted to show people that um, a range of, of pattern. Um, and so she actually appliqued this, this wild goose chase, um, even though it would be traditionally done as a pieced pattern using old pieces of cloth. So we move from the 17th and 18th century, uh, where we have some of our oldest pieces, um, into the second, the third section, which is called Crafting a Nation, which covers the first half of the 19th century. And um, one thing that sort of is for me that was really fascinating was that uh, when we were writing the book, which uh, is comprised of essays, object essentially essays on each each quilt or each bed cover. Um, you know, one out of necessity thinks of them as very individual. And then when we're planning the exhibition, we use we use images of the object and imagine them in space with obviously the help of, of amazing our amazing colleagues in, in exhibition design. But when, when one starts to put them up together, that's when there's these wonderful visual com conversations. So something that we're going to pursue after the show's over is, um, uh, and and this would be done by my incredible colleague in uh, in textile conservation, Meredith Montague, who's head of textile conservation. She wants to dye test this orange wool from a quilt made in Solon, Maine, in the 1830s, with the orange dye used on this wool thread that made the pile for this bed rug, made in southeastern Connecticut uh, in the 1790s. So it's sort of a generation earlier to see if they're made from the same same thing. What I found fascinating was how much the vocabulary of bed covers, whether it was in a pieced quilts or in uh, embroidered uh, and and embroidered bed rugs. Um, or bed covers uh, had transferred itself across time and um, how much these patterns persist. And that's one of the reasons that we didn't just wanna have quilts in this exhibition. We have, uh, the MFA has such a strong collection that spans bed covers made in a, in a range of techniques. And, um, and these, these objects uh, had influenced each other over time, um, maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly. And we felt that was an important part of the story. It also increased our geographic footprint. So for example, we were able to include um, this beautiful Rio Grande blanket. It was actually a recent acquisition. Um, and uh, we felt like that was actually an exciting thing to do because we could put it right next to a Baltimore album quilt, which of course one would expect to see in a quilt exhibition uh, in, in an urban art museum, but they were both made around the same time in the mid 18th century before the Civil War. And so we could open up some conversations about what was happening in the United States, how was the United States becoming the United States uh, in the mid 19th century and, and what that was leading to. I feel like um, I feel that every time I'm in this space crafting a nation, which um, of course includes our wonderful Harry Tyler that we received from the American Textile History Museum's collection, we're very fortunate uh, to to receive several very important uh, bed covers and uh, which included coverlets and and a few um, important quilts from the American Textile History Museum. Um, that. Uh, 
uh, this section in particular, which is which is not one of the largest, uh, it only has five five works in it. This is what one might expect if one were to go with someone to a quilt museum at the Museum of Fine Arts or another another museum. And I just wanted to show a detail of our Baltimore album quilt. And this gives me an opportunity to sort of place the MFA's collecting history in context. So essentially most of the quilts and uh, most of the quilts that were in the collection before 1999 when this Baltimore album quilt was acquired were came to the collection either as uh, part of a larger constellation of textiles and other objects owned by uh, wealthy Boston families and wealthy New England families. Um, they, um, <clears throat> or they were uh, donated and were part of a family, uh, a family story or demonstrated really uh, accomplished embroidery. Um, or they were considered uh, folk art. Um, so we didn't really, as a department, uh, the textile and fashion arts department didn't really start collecting quilts in earnest until uh, 1999 when this Baltimore album quilt came in. So for example, this quilt was acquired, uh, was donated actually uh, by the descendants of the maker in 1964. And, uh, and the curatorial recommendation noted that, you know, this seems much better than most quilts. <laughs> and I think because the curator at the time was very interested in embroidery. And so each scene is beautifully embroidered with um, views of Lynn, Massachusetts. This was uh, the childhood home of the maker, Celestine Bachelor whose father, and you can actually see her on a boat picking water lilies or her imagined self picking water lilies as a young girl. This was her family home in Lynn, Massachusetts. And when her father died in the Civil War, he had been, before this, he had been a, a uh, he had owned a dye works in, in Lynn, Massachusetts or in um, Dyer's Village. And, uh, but when he, after he died, in the Civil War, the family, she and her mothers essentially had to go to work and support themselves. Um, so they moved to Boston and she became a seamstress as her mother and sisters did and eventually became the head of a tailor shop in Boston. So um, this is just a very personal, um, very personal story that we place in the broader context of the history of the Civil War in this, this gallery called um, conflict without resolution. And, um, but like many quilts, it looks back. Um, it is of its time in the sense that it is a, it is a irregularly pieced silk quilt. It could be called a crazy quilt with this incredible embroidery. Um, but it is very distinct even within that category. Um, so these are the historical works of art in conflict without resolution, or what we in shorthand would call the civil war gallery. And um, in this quilt, which is uh, which we acquired also for the project, uh, it was made uh, in or is embroidered with 1864. And the imagery uh, in it, uh, this is a, a Zouave soldier uh, that was the form was taken, the figure was taken from uh, a uh, 1863 summer issue of Harper's Weekly as was this image of General Grant riding to victory in Vicksburg uh, in 1863. So this is clearly because it has images of war on it. This is not made for a bed. <laughs> this quilt is really a turning point in the exhibition because this is the first quilt that the visitors see that was really made for a wall. We think it was made for the Sanitary Commission Fair in Philadelphia in 1864. And so the Sanitary Commission they were groups, local groups of mostly women who made bedrolls and supply, they pr provided supplies for union hospitals, whether that was in actual um, actual things that they needed, often textiles or in funds. And so they had fundraising fairs. And um, I think that's important because most of the quilts from this point on, from this gallery on, uh, were made uh, in some way were, were appreciated in public venues on walls and often made for that. When we were working on the exhibition and uh, which, hap which started before the pandemic, and then when we were experiencing the pandemic and trying to figure out, we're trying to like address and anticipate 
what viewers would want from an art exhibition during this period of national, global, and personal familial stress um, and change. And um, we came to the realization that, um, and this was partly born out of two acquisitions that occurred at this point, unfortunately too late to put in the catalog or the, the publication that was already had already gone to the printer. Um, but these two important acquisitions um, were the leverage of change and rethinking, do we want to present all of these works in a neat chronological line? Or we, do we want to disrupt or stop that chronology and get people to think about in this moment of instead of marching through time, what was really the legacy of the Civil War? And not that the MFA would necessarily interpret that, but that what works of art can we show um, that, that ask that question. Um, so we were very fortunate to be able to acquire for the collection, Dr. Carolyn Metzlumi's Strange Fruit. Her work um, now uh, is not appliqued with lots of layers of cloth. Uh, she will design a composition, which is silkscreen onto a piece of cotton, which she then, she then quilts, like almost like a whole cloth quilt. We had had the, um, Faith Ringgold story quilt in the collection since 1991. She made it in, 19, uh, in the late 1980s, and um, it, it includes an image of Dr. Martin Luther King, but surrounded by women who were very important uh, in the civil rights movement, including his wife, Coretta Scott King, and Fannie Lou Hamer. And then around this image of these women who uh, were so important to the civil rights movement is a transcription of her daughter's speech, Michelle Wallace's speech, which, is, which was related to her own scholarly and social critique work on the, uh, on the contributions of women to the civil rights movement. Um, we had acquired um, Sanford Biggers, a deeper form of chess, uh, while uh, before the pandemic, um, but it seemed to be very appropriate to have here um, because it addresses in a broader time frame uh, the uh, Pan-African diaspora violence against Black bodies. And um, I do like to point out that this quilt, uh, which is a, a tied comforter, he, he actually cut it right down here and then flipped it so that Everything to the right of this scene, your seam is actually the back, the original back of the quilt. And then he sewed um, a nylon striped, almost like a rep, sort of upholstery fabric across that seam uh, in these uh, um, sort of parallelogram shapes and then, and then uh, adhered pieces of that to this figure. And how he makes his sculptural pieces um, is he takes from his collection of African carved sculpture or sculpture that's made to look like it is, is African, it is from Africa. He takes those figures out to a shooting range where a studio assistant ballistically re-sculpts them or essentially shoots them and he takes a video of that. And then he takes that figure that has been essentially transfigured um, and he casts that. So this is a casting of one of those figures. And um, it's quite, um, it's a very, it gives people, this whole section gives people pause. People will stand, visitors will stand and, and really look at Dr. Carolyn Matsulumi's Strange Fruit 2 and read the label text. They'll also pause in front of this untitled work by, uh, by Michael Thorpe. Michael Thorpe is an artist who's now based in New York, but he's originally from Newton, Massachusetts, and his mother is a quilt maker. He studied photography, but uh, when his mother got a long arm quilting machine, he said, I want to use that too. So he, um, and he made this, I'll go back to this, sorry. He made this piece uh, untitled The Day After the Murder of George Floyd and posted it on Instagram along with a poem. And the work was actually acquired by the head of interpretation at the time. So um, in thinking about how we were going to present these, these works of art with um, you know, very challenging content and dif difficult imagery, 
um, we wanted to make sure that all the artists were given the opportunity if they wanted to they could submit statements that we would include in the in the uh, in the label and um, we also have which actually anyone listening right now can can download and watch themselves uh, or listen to themselves we have the mfa audio app and in that app there are which is which is the sort of substitute the the, the new audio guide essentially um there, so there are no more headphones it's an app that you can download on your phone or you can you can watch on your own computer and um, it includes 10 stops throughout the exhibition, but you can watch it anytime. You can listen to it anytime. And of those 10 stops, five are by artists, including Dr. Carolyn Matsumi, talking about what this work is to her and what the song Strange Fruit meant to her growing up in the Jim Crow South. And also of uh, Michael Thorpe, this is the day that uh, his work was picked up outside of his house, describing what his feelings were, what, what, why he made that work and what it means to him. One thing that we learned from our Table of Voices, a Table of Voices advisory group, um, they strongly suggested that we give the visitor a moment of pause and reflection in the exhibition at this point. And um, they had suggested maybe water or plants or the sound of water, something. And because we can't have any organic materials in the exhibition, um, one of our very talented exhibition designers um, had an idea to put essentially two pieces of nylon carpet up on the wall with a raking light and it is the one textile that people can touch and i think it channels this idea of quilts as communal products or as communal activities because people are constantly uh, there and they're looking at the work done by others and how others have left their mark and then they leave leave their own although it did take visitors a while to to be willing to touch it so in the next gallery which we've titled quilts as art we have the two harriet powers quilts these are very special to have both of these the one on the right is called the pictorial quilt it was uh, a donation to the museum also in 1964 and uh, it was made by harriet powers who was uh, born into slavery in uh, 1837 outside of Athens, Georgia. Uh, so she made the pictorial quilt that you can see on the right around 1895 to 1898. And then she made the Bible quilt about 10 years before that, around 1885, 1886. The quilt on the left, which is called the Bible quilt, she called it Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, is part of the Smithsonian's collection. Um, and they generously lent it to us for this exhibition. We have uh, with um, the MFA's pictorial quilt, um, the family that owned it, who were descendants of the Presbyterian minister who served on the board of Atlanta College, now Clark University. Um, <clears throat> he was given this as a gift for his service. And um, the uh, faculty ladies, as his wife described them, um, of Atlanta University also gave him this key with a uh, transcription of Harriet Power's own description of each scene, as well as a small photograph or carte de visite that um, you can see blown up here. So these, these descriptions of each scene are essentially her artist statement. And you'll notice in the photograph that she's wearing an apron that she made herself with, um, uh, <clears throat> with her reverse applique stars that you can also see in the quilt. And she's holding a piece of cloth, she's working on stitching. So um, maybe she wouldn't have called herself an artist, but she certainly was very aware of her accomplishments in the quilt medium. The uh, Smithsonian's Bible quilt was a very noted, uh, celebrated work of art that was on view uh, at the Cotton States Fair in Atlanta in 1895. And uh, so this is Michael Thorpe visiting his own work uh, and, and a view of the next gallery, which we've titled Modern Myths. And uh, we're taking that story of quilts as something that was on, that's something to be made uh, as, as works of art or visual, vis something visual to be, to be experienced by groups of Americans. Um, uh, into the early 20th century. <clears throat> um, we borrowed this quilt, um, which is uh, the Spectrum quilt made by Edith Morrow Matthews from her great niece. And um, in it, we wanted to use it to talk about the Chicago World's Fair of 1933. And it's just such a 
beautiful work of art. I think um, having it next to this depression era uh, double wedding ring that uh, is attributed to an unknown African-American quilter. Uh, it was found uh, by the collectors, uh, Gerald Roy and Paul Pilgrim in, uh, in, in an, uh, an area outside of Jefferson City, Missouri in the 80s and then to and then sort of bookending our our wall here this is my, one of my favorite walls in the exhibition is uh the courthouse courthouse steps quilt by georgiana and crayola bennett petway it was actually acquired by uh from their great niece also, um, who lives in the Boston area. And she's been able to tell us a lot about what it was like to grow up in G's Bend. She was part of uh, the last uh, graduating class from the high school of G's Bend. And um, this work actually is not in the publication, um, but I wanted to include it in the exhibition. Um, it's obviously a log cabin, and um, it's made in G's Bend by uh, the late Lily May Pepper. Lily May Petway, probably around 1965. And uh, I wanted to include it partly because um, the next gallery shows quilts that were made as art um, for art museum walls or for gallery walls. And the uh, phenomenon of G's Bend um, quilts being shown on art walls sort of leads into that. But I also really wanted to show it because her daughter, Marianne Petway, lives in G's Bend. Uh, she runs the cooperative where people make quilts and she still makes quilts herself. So I wanted to remind the visitor that um, this is a living, vibrant art form. Um, this just gives you a sense of the texture and uh, and just real beauty of these of these treasures in our collection. So the last part of the exhibition, which is actually one of the sort of hardest gallery to design because all the work is so different. Um, it actually covers about 50 years. It starts in 1975. Um, this large ball quilt called Krakow Kabuki Waltz by Virginia Jacobs was made when she lived in Philadelphia in uh, 1987. And um, for those of you who were subscribers to the Smithsonian Magazine, it was also appeared on the cover with her sitting in front of it like, like Harriet Powers. Uh, sewing in a kimono that she made herself. Um, and she didn't know it was going to work until she blew it up at seven feet in diameter. And she never made another ball quilt after that. Um, so we wanted to show what, uh, how ambitious quilt makers were in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and how they continue to be ambitious, whether it is size or subject matter. Um, the, uh, I would say the most commented on quilt is by um, <coughs> Augusta Augustin, who also is a local artist. Um, she was a graduate of Mass College of Art and um, was actually trained as a printmaker. We have, we have an example of her, uh, a print in the MFA's collection. And she made this quilt, Blanket of Red Flowers, in 1975. It hung on the wall of Boston City Hall in a, in a group show for 24 hours <laughs> before Mayor Kevin White's Cultural Council said, you, you got to take that off. Um, and, uh, and then it did travel with an exhibition of art quilts to university art galleries in Chicago and Wisconsin, but it was not not illustrated in the catalog. So um, I'm proud to say that it is part of the MFA's collection. It is included in the publication and it is now hanging uh, in the museum. And for those of you who, um, who are deeply enmeshed in the history of quilting, um, you'll recognize uh, Watchtower by Molly Upton. Um, she made this in her early 20s uh, in Boston City Hall in 1975 as part of preparation, it was an NEA grant funded project to have artists work along the Freedom Trail. So she and Susan Hoffman, who made this triptych, um, uh, and they made, they set up their studio inside City Hall and worked for a couple of weeks on both of these quilts. Uh, this is called Coastline. And then eventually both were part of an ICA funded or ICA uh, organized exhibition at the Boston Center for the Arts. So I wanted to include these because uh, they show that um, this quilt revival that occurred in the 70s um, 
Well, it's in fact very urban and, um, and while it channeled uh, many aspects of quilt making that could be looked at as, as sort of traditional, um, they, were, they were using it in different ways and, um, but always looking, looking back and inspired by, by quilts. Um, for example, um, Ed Larson's uh, Nixon Resigns or Nixon resignation quilt, uh, also made in 1975. <clears throat> he designed over 200 story quilts, um, but couldn't really execute them himself. So he would design them on a large piece of brown paper and uh, have all the colors marked out. He would buy the, buy the fabric for the quilt maker, in this case, Fran Soika of Ohio. And she was an award-winning quilt maker on her own, in her own right, um, with her own following. And, um, and, uh, and he would encourage quilters like Fran Soika, who he considered equal collaborators with him on the piece to um, go out and get their own, you know, get the fabric themselves. They could add embroidery and other, other elements. Um, and so that was like, again, another important part of this story of who was coming to quilting in the 70s and 80s and how were these artists um, uh, reworking, like changing the medium for their own, using the medium for their own expressive purposes. Um, one uh, quilt that we did acquire, um, unfortunately too late to include in the publication, but perhaps we'll have a second edition, um, is this quilt, hashtag how many more by Sylvia Hernandez, who is based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she uh, came rather late in life to quilting. Um, she had trained as an artist and couldn't really pursue it. Her children graduated from school and uh, she's been quilting for 10 years and I don't think she stopped. Um, and so it's a very powerful piece that visitors will pause by often. And we leave people, um, the visitor, one of the last quilts that they see as, as in the exhibition is this work um, called Survivors by Carla Hemlock, who is a Mohawk quilter or Haudenosaunee. She lives in Ganawage, which is just south of Montreal. And uh, in it, in her description, she takes uh, what she calls a traditional settler pattern, the star pattern, and in a sense sort of subverts it with these appliqued um, wampum figures. And then on the outside in a ring, rather like the Haudenosaunee uh, flag or symbol, um, she includes 48 uh, uh, joined uh, wampum figures that are, um, that are uh, outlined in, in this rope bead. And then within each are names of, of the individual, um, individual cultures. And so like Carla Hemlock and uh, Susan Hoffman and Virginia Jacobs and Augusta Augustin, they've come to visit the exhibition. And of course, Michael Thorpe. And uh, it's been my pleasure to share with them that you know these visitors are here and they're experiencing their work in this larger project that spans um, centuries and um, so I just wanted to leave you with her her own her own impression and that is my slides and it looks like there are a lot of questions already <laughs> that's my department that was just fabulous um, Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yes, there actually, um, as we, we started talking a little bit before we started the webinar, there was a lot of interest just in the, how, how you conceived of the exhibition. You mentioned you started on the book in 2017, then the exhibition came. Um, a few weeks ago, Lucy Levy from the International Quilt Museum also talked about how they conceive and execute their exhibition. So could you expand on it a little bit and one specific question was um, how, how they were mounted. Some of them I see you had on slant boards or framed and some were just hung. And maybe you could just talk about the logistics of displaying not just quilts, but textiles as well. Well, those are all such good questions. And um, generally, uh, generally it goes the opposite way. So usually it's flipped. Um, we'll have an, an idea for an exhibition. And then um, because it is in a gallery like the Gun Gallery, which is 
uh, about ten, it's one of the it's the largest gallery that we have in the MFA, and there is usually a, uh, a catalog that is produced with the exhibition. So that is how um, the catalog for Quilts and Color was produced, for example. Both the exhibition and the catalog are envisioned and worked on in tandem, essentially. And uh, this was flipped originally. We were going to have a publication that was going to be a highlights on our American quilt and bed cover collection. And I think at some point around the time when we, really when we acquired Bisa Butler's work to God and Truth, I think it got to be a more exciting exhibition idea because the work itself is almost 12 feet wide. At the time, it was the biggest quilt that she had ever made. And it demonstrated um, to people who might not think of quilts as art that this is in fact an art form that is vibrant and alive and um, and very relevant to to what visitors want to see. So I think I think actually Bisa Butler was really her work was really the one that sort of tipped tipped the balance into making this an exhibition. Generally, most of the works are hung uh, free from uh, from a from basically a, a slat uh, on the wall. And uh, there is no Velcro sewn directly to any of the quilts, but, um, but to a piece of cloth that's sewn to the back of, of the quilt. And then the Velcro is about, um, I think it's about almost three and a half, three and a half inches wide. And that gives the um, textile conservators a little leeway in how they, how they can shape the quilt at the top, because all of you who have tried to hang quilts on the wall know that they are not square. <laughs> And they have ears, so you have to smooth out the ears. Um, there are some quilts, you're right, that are um, are mounted. Um, so the Baltimore album quilt was mounted, um, and that was just because there were so many um, fragile pieces that we don't want that to hang loose. Um, and then uh, the Celestine Bachelor silk quilt of Lynn, that <clears throat> that was framed, and I think that also helps the visitor because, and then where it is placed also helps because. We can have the the label is on the wall, and it's fine to have the label on the wall in that sense, in that in that instance, because it's under it's glazed, it's under under non reflective glass, so you can see and look at all the details, and then look at the uh, the label. All the other labels are on the label rail, which are are placed eighteen inches from the wall, or I think actually twenty four inches from the wall, and um, and that's good too because it means that because quilts. Yes, we want to get up close and see them closely, but they're also meant to be experienced far enough back. Um, and I will tell you that my brother-in-law, who is 6'4", <laughs> he could read our labels. <laughs> Even, so that was pretty good. <laughs> now, it's important that they be the right font size so that you can yeah. read them for distance. Um, yes, or, or with glasses or without glasses. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Life after this exhibition, I assume it's not traveling because so many of the pieces um, have are light sensitive. Is that true? Actually, we are currently looking for, we are hoping to travel it. Yes. And as okay. soon as we have confirmation, I will let you know because it would be wonderful. Um, it would be a wonderful opportunity for people in other parts of the country or other parts of the world to be able to see it. Fabulous. That's fabulous news. I'm so glad to hear that because there were questions about, you know, life after this exhibition. Um, are you doing any um, lectures, videos for schools, for high schools, you know, middle schools? Um, and, and will there be a supplement maybe to the catalog that includes the late editions, either virtual <laughs> or in print? These are all wonderful ideas. I wish, um, and thank you for being my thought partners. <laughs> um, yes, we, we could not include, so just so that everyone is clear, so there's no disappointment um, or no, no surprises. There are 58 works of art in the publication. They are all almost entirely in the MFA's collection. Um, and they are all within the textile department, essentially. There are textiles. And then in the exhibition, 40 of those works are in the exhibition plus five of the late editions, plus the five loans. So there's a little bit of a difference between the two. And it would be wonderful to have a second edition or some kind of publication that um, would give people access to the works that, we that I talked about that we weren't able to include in the publication because they are so important. Um, and, uh, but you can go online and hear Sylvia Hernandez talk about her work, um, hashtag how many more, and um, and the other and the and Dr. Carolyn Matsumi also and Michael Thorpe. 
So, um, so yes, we hope. And then for educators, um, we did have a terrific virtual program that celebrated the uh, life and work of Harriet Powers and the African American story quilt tradition. Uh, the speakers included Bisa Butler and um, Dr. Carolyn Metzlumi and uh, Kyra Hicks and Taya Miles, who you can see her video of, about the Harriet Powers quilt on the MFA's website, along with Bisa Butler's video about her own work. Um, so that will be posted. Um, the recording of that virtual celebration will be posted on the MFA's YouTube channel um, very, very soon. So I would think that would be a good, a good resource for, um, for educators as well. What, a, what an amazing array of resources. It's, it's fabulous because as you know, you work so hard on an exhibition like this and then poof, it's gone. I mean, yes. you have to look, but that's not the same as the exhibition. Um, and it, again, I know you have an embarrassment of riches um, at the MFA. How did you decide what to include? And I, I think it was interesting. You made the comment that Bisa Butler's was kind of like one of the catalysts for the show, but you know, you've got that. And then, so how, how did you, how did you, narrowed narrow it down to only 58. <laughs> it was so difficult. Well, we had to make the choice for 58 for the publication and we only really had space for 50 works of art in the exhibition. So um, so that was even harder. You know, like it's like, I think any process where, you know, we have about 350 under 400 quilts that are American or have American provenance. So to get down to about 100 is pretty easy. It's getting, and then you can get down to like 80. And it's just, it's really those last decisions that represent about 25% you know, those are the hardest ones to make. And um, then they go in and out and in and out. And it was so great working with Pam Parmel and Lauren Whitley because we all brought sort of different ways of seeing these works. And we, um, Lauren Whitley had done so much work um, uh, on other part, on, on, on actually specific quilts in the collection. So, um, so we were really drawing on, uh, uh, and, and of course, and then lots of outside researchers had done really important work on Harriet Powers, including Kyra Hicks. So um, because so much work had been done over the years and we were able to do a lot of research on the quilts in the book, those connections, those like conceptual connections were much easier to make for the exhibition because we had already done a lot of deep thinking about that group of 58. And so that 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 was really a luxury that was just very specific to this project to have that publication to work on first and then and then start the exhibition planning. Uh, and I love your phrase disrupting chronology. And I just have to say an aside the exhibition now at San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles is 50 years of the art quilt. And both Amy and Samantha have done a brilliant, I was the curator, I selected, I was one of three who selected the works, but they did the layout and um, it's fabulous. It's not chronological, but it really allows viewers um, to kind of make associations and, and conversations across decades. I mean, it's just decades, it's not centuries. Do you think that that's, um, going to be a new trend in museums where it's not just a, a document of, of the history, but it's like, okay, what does this 19th century work say to this 21st century work? I, I think as so many people um, have a chance to um, think about, you know, American, like, like this idea of like this American quilt, like, you know, it's sort of, it's a myth that it's really an American art form, except, you know, exclusively. And, and I think so many people have also have their own, and this was certainly born out in, in Fabric of a Nation, people come with their own quilt stories, whether they have a quilt at home or not, you know, whether they read um, Alice Walker's A Quilt Like No Other or The Color Purple, like there is something baked into our culture that connects people to quilts. And so I think it, that, as you said, like it allows a certain freedom in um, uh, not having to explain them within that chronology or necessarily frame them within that chronology. So I, and I think, and I think people particularly as, you know, quilters really dive into all of these different, different topics and stories and and then the medium itself is it's not it's not just one medium it's like so many pulled together so i think it's a very rich subject for um for framing in lots of different ways that are engaging yes so you, the answer is yes <laughs> <laughs> well thank you jennifer um some of the comments that weren't really questions is 
they loved the exhibition, the installation shot, so they could see the scale of the oh, work, good. but also the close-ups and the details when you could show them. And just what an amazingly broad range, chronologically, aesthetically, culturally, of works. I mean, what a rich exhibition. And along with a couple of other attendees, I, I really enjoyed seeing Molly Upton's work and Susan Hoffman's. Um, I'd seen Molly's once before, but I hadn't seen that of, of Susan. So maybe I'll see it in person. I don't know, we'll see. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this was really wonderful. And uh, for those of you in the Boston area, or I tell you, if you're anywhere within driving distance of Boston, go see it, you won't, you won't be sorry. Um, the show will be on view until January 17th. And we've also put their website, the MFA website in the chat. So please make sure to read more about the exhibition there. As Jennifer said, there is lots of material, lots of, lots of resources. So before thanking our sponsors and signing off, I wanna add a personal note because today is my last day of my last textile talk as director of the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles where I've worked since 2013 and the last four and a half years as director. So I want to acknowledge and thank the museum's curatorial team, who you just see their names there, Amy DePlacido and Samantha Lyons, because they have done the heavy lifting behind the scenes the past 18 months so that we could present these textile talks to all of you. And I also want to thank the artists and the presenters who have been a part of the museum's presentations. It's been a privilege and an honor to get to know you. And finally, thank you to all the attendees all over the world for your enthusiasm, your financial support, and I actually look forward to 2022 when I presumably will have more leisure to watch textile talks in real time and catch up on some that I've missed. So I'll see you in the chat. And in closing, I do wanna thank our sponsors again for supporting this event. Um, we'll be sharing the presentation on YouTube and Facebook afterwards. So if you didn't have time to, if you had to leave early or you came late, you can see the whole thing in a few days. Um, and if you enjoyed the talk and would like to donate or become a member of the museum, please visit our website, sjquiltmuseum.org. This is the last textile talk of the year and will return on January 5th at the usual Wednesday time. And thank you so much for being part of this community. Uh, we wish you a happy holiday season and hope to see you in the new year. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>